Now, China's new foreign minister has called for stabilizing relations with the United States. It comes amid the possibility of a meeting to reset economic ties between the two countries later this month. Ambassador Catherine Tai serves as the U.S. trade representative, a child of Chinese immigrants. She's breaking barriers in that role, and she's joining Walter Isaacson to discuss the Biden administration's approach to trade and how her heritage influences her work. Thank you, Christian and Ambassador Catherine Tai. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. The big news this week is reports that you will be meeting in Detroit with the uh, Chinese Commerce Minister. It would, it would be, if that happens, the highest ranking meeting for the U.S. in about a year with Chinese counterparts. I know that's not been confirmed, but what would be the significance of that meeting if it happens? Well, um, I am hosting the uh, APEC Ministers Responsible for Trade meeting at the end of this month. And uh, as you may know, um, the United States is one of the 21 member economies of APEC, and uh, we are the host for this year, 2023. Um, I'm really looking forward to hosting this meeting in Detroit to show off um, the history of Detroit as a center of American innovation. I think probably the most significant aspect of a meeting, should it happen, is um, to provide us with an opportunity uh, to reconnect with um, uh, one of my interlocutors in Beijing um, to check in uh, since the um, administration transition uh, in uh, Beijing um, as President Xi Jinping has taken uh, his unprecedented to third term there. Um, so I think in my expectation, um, it will be an important uh, reconnection, uh, a bit of a level set in terms of uh, reestablishing um, communication channels and relationships. Do you think that it's time for a reset or a leveling of this relationship? It's been very confrontational. And you said uh, in one of your talks that we don't really want to decouple from China. We can't do that. We have a lot of challenges with China. As someone on the economic team, let me just focus on uh, the economic relationship. Uh, the U.S.-China relationship is one of profound consequence in the global economy. We are the world's two largest economies. Um, how we relate to each other uh, has grave implications, serious implications, not just for us, the U.S. economy, our workers and our businesses, the Chinese economy, its workers and businesses, but for the entire world. And that is the reason why it is so important for us to take an extremely responsible, deliberative approach that is focused on being strategic, being effective, in addressing the significant challenges that we do have in this relationship. So um, uh, I think that um, it's not confrontation that we are looking for. However, many of the conversations that we need to have are going to be difficult. Which ones are going to be the most difficult? I think that fundamentally, in terms of the U.S. approach to trade, uh, we are working on rebalancing in many different ways. When I took on this job and President Biden asked me to join his cabinet, he asked me to bring a new approach to trade that the Biden administration would advance what he specifically asked for um, to be a worker-centered trade policy. And that reflects a recognition that the trade policies that we have pursued across administrations over the past decades, the trade policies that have been prioritized worldwide, have um, really uh, hit some significant limits. Um, we are seeing for ourselves uh, what happens when uh, you prioritize trade liberalization, the maximization of efficiency uh, at the expense of um, uh, investing in your workers. Wait, wait, so you're saying the past 20 years of trade liberalization have actually been bad for the American worker and we have to change that. You, Jake Sullivan, President Biden, are changing our trade policy? Well, uh, we've got to change our approach, and we are looking for different trade outcomes. We are looking for outcomes that are more inclusive. We are advancing approaches and processes that are more inclusive also. And when we say we're going to put workers at the center, that is a recognition that U.S. trade policy has for too long not had workers at its center and had placed workers at the periphery. This is a uh, 
needed, not just for us, but I think that it is a um, globalization trend that we are trying to uh, advance uh, with our partners, which is to say that in a world where uh, you have maximized and you have incentivized cost efficiency at, at the expense of everything else, we see for ourselves widening uh, inequality economically, not just here in the United States, but in economies around the world. So we need more inclusive outcomes. At the same time, we've all just gone through and are still going through economic disruptions that have come from the pandemic and demonstrated how fragile our global supply chains are. We've done a lot of diagnoses in terms of the vulnerabilities in our supply chains, but for those of us working in trade, it is very, very clear that the incentives that we have put into the global trading system have failed to provide for resilience in the global economy. And that is something we badly need. You talked about COVID disrupting the supply chains. Well, today is the day that they lift the federal emergency on COVID. How will that change trade? And what type of snarling of trade was caused by COVID? What are you going to do about that? Sure. So uh, in the early days of COVID, um, if it isn't too painful to think back to March of 2020, when we and a lot of the other economies around the world went into lockdown. At that time, the entire world needed the same things at the same time. We did not have enough supply for the demand. So make more supply. But what we discovered was so much of what we needed has been concentrated in one economy, and that is uh, the Chinese economy. And the Chinese economy was the first one to lock down because of COVID. So they were not going to the factories to uh, manufacture and very little was coming in, uh, coming out of um, or being produced there. I was working for the U.S. Congress at the time. Um, members of Congress and their staffs went from being the representatives in Washington to being their supply chain representatives to try to find whatever supply there might be around the world and to procure it and obtain it for their constituents back at home. I think for us, those painful lessons have to inform how we approach trade policy going forward to ensure that the next crisis that we encounter, whether it's an extreme climate event, whether it's another epidemic or a pandemic, uh, or um, a natural disaster, or increasingly because of geopolitical tensions, that we have built into the global economic system shock absorption and uh, alternative uh, pathways, plans B and C, uh, to allow us to pivot and to adapt to the crisis situation. When you were testifying in front of a House committee a few weeks ago, you got into a conversation with Congresswoman Steele, a Republican of California who's a Korean-American heritage. And in some ways, it was a Republican versus a Democrat, but two Asian-American women debating how trade policy could be. But I was also struck that there was some consensus that's being formed on trade policy between Democrats and Republicans, unlike on other issues. That's right. Although, you know, in trade policy, it's something very interesting. And I've seen this happen in um, the um, the competition policy where the, uh, the mon anti-monopoly folks, antitrust people are working. Um, we see in both of these areas um, two centers that are forming. So, you know, in our politics, usually there's 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 a center and then there, there are the fringes. And uh, in trade, for instance, um, something that you followed, uh, the traditional center has been, you know, um, free trade Republicans and the pro-business, you know, new Democrats. Um, <clears throat> what we see is that the progressives on the left and the populists on the right are meeting in a new center, one that is a pro-worker uh, and pro-competition that is trying to take on the oversized corporate power, looking to rebalance right um, the, uh, the equities within our system. And uh, that gives me a huge amount of room to move uh, on a bipartisan basis. So uh, on this too, I have a lot of hope that there is a way for us to advance trade policy that is well supported here at home, that allows us to lead with confidence around the world, but also allows us to show to the American people that we are investing in them and we are not selling out their futures through our trade policy.
The Biden administration hasn't really pursued a comprehensive free trade agreement that would help us on things like battery supply parts. And we're very dependent, not just on batteries, but uh, the uh, enhanced lithium, and that's been refined in China. How come we don't have a uh, broader free trade agreement on things like that? And is it going to hurt our EV, our electric vehicle industry? Um, I think the reason why we're not doing free trade agreements the way we've traditionally done them right now, those types of negotiations, is precisely because uh, when you uh, lead an agency like the U.S. Trade Representative's Office and you are working with all of the experts in all of the specific areas and the uh, the engineers around all the cogs and the wheels inside of a trade agreement, uh, you recognize that um, a traditional free trade agreement that is broadly liberalizing like we have negotiated in the past um, is not actually a very good supply chain creating um, framework. Wait, wait, why is that? Yes, because um, more often than not, they're designed to be leaky. Um, free trade agreements between countries, uh, between two countries or three or more, are meant to facilitate integration between those countries. And there are areas where you see very successful examples. However, the preferences that are created through those agreements uh, are not airtight. Uh, they are designed to be um, uh, weighted in favor of overall liberalization. So every single one of our free trade agreements does create benefits for what we would call free riders, other countries not a part of that agreement. And the concern that we have right now is that part of that aggressively liberalizing, weighted in favor of liberalization type of framework has led us to the point where when you're chasing the lowest cost, that production has shown that it ends up pooling in only certain places around the world and sometimes only one place. But during this period, when we're walking away from what you call broad-based free trade agreements, China's doing the opposite. China has created major uh, alliances and free trade agreements and uh, throughout the Pacific region and actually throughout the world. And you talked about the Indo-Pacific uh, Indo economic framework that we're still talking about. We're not even close. We're not, there's not even much of a substance there. We're not near signing an agreement. Are we going to lose out to China if we let them do major free trade agreements and we don't? No, um, we can't and we won't. I think that your characterization of the Indo-Pacific economic framework, while I hear it quite often, reflects a major misunderstanding of what it is that we're doing. Our vision for the Indo-Pacific economic framework is that it is a negotiating forum. We are negotiating important types of rules and important approaches. At the same time, we see this as a framework that is going to endure over time. This is not a one and done. If you look at a lot of the trade agreements that have been done, uh, certainly ones we've done and that have been done around the world, um, you invest all this political capital to get this one agreement done, and then you move on. Uh, and you don't look back. Trade agreements take too long to negotiate. <clears throat> they are not participatory enough. And right now, what we need are agile systems, agile approaches to cooperating with our partners and our allies to adapt to all of the changes that are happening in the global economy. And I would argue that our failure to innovate the way that we trade and the way that we negotiate is more dangerous to our ability to survive and to thrive than the web of what they call the noodle bowl of trade agreements that have been uh, existing in the Asia Pacific for a very long time. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis just signed legislation saying that the Chinese could not buy land in Florida unless they were U.S. citizens or permanent residents. Let me read you something he said. He said, we don't want the Chinese Communist Party in the Sunshine State. We want to maintain this as a free state of Florida. There's been similar legislation in Texas and even something introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives. What do you say to that? 
So I was aware of the legislation pending and introduced in Texas, um, but uh, not in Florida, which sounds like it's gotten much further along. Um, what I would say to this is, like so many of our challenges with China, our challenges with the government and its policies. The challenge is not with the Chinese people. It is not a challenge with Chineseness or people of Chinese heritage. And so here in the United States, because I am a member of the Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander mm -hmm. community, it's something that I think about quite a lot, but certainly because our AA and NHPI communities are an integral part of the American economy, the American polity of America, it is even more incumbent on us to ensure that when we take on the challenges that we see from uh, our relating to the Chinese government, that we exercise a very high degree of discipline in defining what the challenge is that we're facing. Only by exercising that discipline do we have the opportunity to fashion policy solutions that will be tailored to addressing that challenge. If we are lazy or sloppy in identifying the problem, the harm that we stand to do to America and our fellow Americans is significant and unacceptable. Ambassador Catherine Tai, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me.